actual footage of New York in the 20s. And the reason that I show this film now and before the other film color I slide still life of New York in the 1900 as segues into the topics. We're about to talk about the so-called second wave of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. And as you can see here, parts of America were booming. New York, wild, Charleston dancing, bootleg whiskey, speakeasy joints. So part of the country after World War I was being hyper-modern, what they thought was modern. Basically, being hyper-modern was everything that wasn't before World War I. So it wasn't Victorian, it wasn't tight corsets and long dresses. It was short, showing skin, loose dresses, um, moves, dancing, things that in the Victorian period wouldn't work at all. While this social revolution was taking place, there were many Americans who reacted to that. Remember those of you who are here for the early program talk about being active, proactive, or reactive? These are reactionary movements that we're talking about in these three slideshows. Um, part of Americans reject all of this. They saw this as alarming, you know, women scantily clad with loose morals, smoking, wearing makeup, dancing all hours of the night with men they didn't know, going for fast rides at night in cars. So <coughs> this is just an entree into the story that I want to tell you, which is a very different one. The next story would be what I call one of the three in our series called the Kaiser, the Klan, and the Cow War. The actually movements in America's heartland 1914 to 34. This story takes place mostly in the 20s. A side question, can we dim the lights a little bit? Can we get a bit darker like it was this morning? Um, <clears throat> these three stories are interrelated, although somewhat separate. Anti-German hysteria World War I, the Kaiser, the Klan, which is this program, and if we have time, which I'd like to do, is the Cow War. <laughs> so this is subtitled The White Cancer, America and its Ku Klux Klan. Why America and its Ku Klux Klan? So this was a nativist movement also, among other things. Nativists coming from the natives, one who was born to a place. Um, many countries have or have had nativist movements. Germans had the Nazis, you know, can't top that. But um, there were nativist movements in Arab countries, um, in Eastern European countries, okay? And in different eras, nativism comes back. In our own country, in the 1800s, the know-nothings were nativists anti-Catholic, anti-German, anti-Irish group. Um, but the Klan, it seems to me, particularly American. Okay? Other nativist movements in other countries often aren't quite as ugly and vile as this has been. So we'll explore that in our slideshow. <clears throat> there was the first wave of the Klan, which occurred, of course, after the Civil War, as of 1865, the defeat of the Confederacy. And we are told that the initial founders were centered around this fellow, um, former Confederate officers, one of the idea of the Confederacy. Now, in later interviews, they said, oh no, we were just sort of joking with all the grand wizard titles and the funny name, the insignias and the hoods. But some of the would-be followers weren't joking. They attracted a lot of dispossessed whites, if you will, lower class whites, poorly educated. Um, they formed the newly formed clan as a way to, quote, keep down the blacks. Keep down the blacks. But it wasn't just aimed at African Americans who had just been released as slaves. If you look at this cartoon of September 1868, the fate of the carpetbagger and the scalawag. Notice the donkey, already then the symbol of the Democratic Party. In other words, the bold evil South, if you want, the bold evil Democrats, the, the old core Democrats, not the modern Democrats. Um, they were often reactionary southern whites. So they would kick your ass, if you will, 
to the carpet bagger hanging here from the tree, notice on his carpet bag is the word Ohio. So a northerner who came south after the Civil War to make profit, to speculate. What was a scalawag? A carpet bagger we know. A scalawag was a white southerner who collaborated with the white northerners. They were seen even a step more vile by the Kudos Klan folks than the northerners. The northerners came as opportunists, but those sons of Dixie who collaborated with them, that was really bad. Here's another cartoon of the period, probably mid um, way through the life of the first wave of the Klan. Dan just saw the horrible sepulcher and bloody moon has the last arrived. And if you read this, it's full of spelling mistakes, like well with one L, um, just with that E rather than U with just. Obviously, the readers were not very literate. Uh, the, the ones who write of this. We'll call the rope, R-O-A-P-E. And the story is they were trying to intimidate the whites who, quote, wanted to recommend a big black nigger for a male agent. Male is misspelled. On our road, road is misspelled. So these are dispossessed whites in the South striking out at Northerners because they see that they say the Northerners are encouraging African Americans to take more leadership positions, like to be the male agent on the road. So indeed, uh, you know, they look a bit buffoonish and clad in a not serious way. Um, the Klan, after the Civil War, did terrorize whites, but also, I should warn you, there will be graphic images throughout our program, also African Americans. These are all children, black children who were mentioned in mass. Um, the first wave, with today's eyes, looks rather amateurish, buffoonish, with poorly made costumes and funny stray symbols here and there, and nothing seems really mimic the mask. Looks like something off a scarecrow. The second wave was really professional in comparison. Now let's talk now about the second wave. Now, comparison, the second wave, those people knew what they were doing. They arose after 1915, and they struggled on through the 30s, the Great Depression, the 40s, the war, and then they sort of died out for a while, or at least the Klan morphed. You can see that after 1915, in the moment we'll talk about why 1915 is a crucial year, after 1915, the Klan began to mushroom toward 1920 quite rapidly, and it exploded outside of the South after 21. 22, you notice that the uh, number of Klan cells expanded in Minnesota, Iowa, and the Prairie Provinces of Canada, although my intern did not this time. You have to rely on the good interns. Um, so you see in the aggregate, they're all over the country, especially outside the South. Great Depression is getting really severe, so the number of new Klan cells decreases. And then, of course, by the end of the 30s, with war coming, um, people have other things in their minds rather than praying around, terrorizing people at night, during crosses. All right, there's the aggregate from that period. Those are just known clan cells. Um, again, they went up in the prairie provinces, New England, the whole country. The most remar remarkable for me are those cells inside the South. I always tell my audiences, you have to be very careful with the culture that you cultivate and broadcast. Um, the things you click like on on your cell phone, um, the films you rent out, and they always know which ones are being watched. Um, the books you read, the conversations you have, because culture is power. And the Klan, in large part, the second wave of the Klan, got its impetus from this man, D.W. Griffith, and his well-made film, The Birth of the Nation, well-made in the sense of cinematography, beautiful images, black, white, crisp, it was the first silent film that was really longer than 20 minutes. I think it was several hours long. The problem was the content was vile and hateful and often inaccurate and, and just bad. So white people wearing blackface posing as African Americans were always the villain, um, threatening the innocent, charming, wonderful, uh, pure white women. Here's a rescue scene where the Klan has come in and saved these girls from the perils of, of, of black man. And notice in the background there's this 
fortress looking place with a, like a medieval castle, really mixed metaphors. And you have to wonder, what is going on here? Anyway, the final scenes of, the, of this long epic, the clan saves, uh, protects the virtue of its black women. We'll come back to that in a bit. Fr uh, Southern historian become pre uh, President Woodrow Wilson was quoted in the film. Okay, there's this mixture between documentary and drama. <coughs> the white men were aroused by the mere instinct of self preservation. <coughs> mere instinct. That's all it was, mere instinct. Until at last there sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. Now, what's interesting, you could spend a long time in class dissecting this. Um, it was an instinct, it's visceral, it's just a mere instinct, that's all. And it spun into existence to protect the empire of the South. I would take that to mean Confederacy, or at least slave holding South, and to protect the Southern country. So it's defensive. They were being attacked, presumably by black people. Who they enslaved and had to keep down when they the Unfortunately, um, history is actually different than what the Ku Klux people maintain. For example, in uh, 1918 19, as the first American troops returned from Europe after World War I, African American troops, soldiers who dared to wear uniforms back here, were too often lynched. Why? In a moment. Indeed, the summer of 1919, called the Red Summer, there were hundreds of riots across the country from the East Coast to the West. Um, also in Oklahoma, where whole black neighborhoods were torched in Chicago. The riots were so bad in Chicago that um, they called them the militia. Now, why was it such a crime, so called crime, in the eyes of the plan for African American? Have American veterans to wear their, their uniforms? Because in a uniform, it puts two people on the same basis. As I say in German, auf Augenhöhe, on an eye level. They're not, the white person isn't talking down necessarily, they're talking across. And notice that in this South Chicago scene, he's conferring with the white militia guy, they're talking side by side. The African Americans without a uniform, they're all in the back, watching, passive. But the one who steps forward and says, wait a minute, what's going on here? He's got a uniform on. So indeed, the uniforms did evoke some authority, some sense of power. And for that many whites, that was very threatening. The um, <coughs> idea behind the whole Red Summer 1919 was these African Americans would come back with Bolshevik ideas. Why? Because the over 100,000 African American troops who we sent to Europe in World War I they didn't fight with the American army, they fought with the French army. Because why? Our army was too segregated. We didn't utilize African American soldiers. So we took them and loaned them to the French, who treated them much better than we would have. And so African American men come back and say, brothers and sisters, it isn't like this all over the world. This is nonsense. This doesn't have to be. We just from France, we were treated more like beans. You might remember who Josephine Baker was, the African-American jazz singer, artist from Kansas City. She was a spectacle in post-war Paris. She was um, extremely popular, okay? So the African-Americans in France, also being heroes, helping to defeat um, Kaiser Germany, they had a different reception. Back to our story, so in fact, like in too many places in 1919 and 20, um, the militia occupied South South Chicago because an African American boy had swum across from the whole black beach of Lake Michigan to the white beach. The white swimmers threw stones, and I think someone had a shock that the boy died. And this started several days or a week of riots where literally white youth and men were chasing African Americans through the back of alleys and yards. Quote, we're going nigger hunting. They broke windows, burned the buildings, and ransacked, and people died. Right? So this is really severe stuff. This isn't playtime. This is, this is real life. People are being hurt and killed and their lives ruined because of this color of skin. Now, we like to think that the problem with the Southerners. Well, let's go to 
the Midwest to take a survey. Chicago has riots in 1919. Omaha, September 1919, Will Brown, the um, stockyard worker, brought up from the south the Delta states, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, during the war's labor replacement. Allegedly, he had molested a German-American girl as she and her boyfriend and walked home from the film one night. I don't know why the boyfriend did in that case would have protected her. At any rate, the mob formed when the sheriff came to arrest Will Brown. The sheriff was able to dispel the mob, which we joined the next morning at the Douglas County Courthouse, which still stands in Omaha, but the windows have been repaired. And they demanded, give us that nigger. And the sheriff said, no, that's not how we do things in Omaha, Nebraska. They assaulted the building, started on fire. The mayor came out to say, I like to Omaha, I like go home. They strung him up on a noose, the mayor of Omaha, and had lifted him into the air on the lamp post. The sheriff came around with the car, cut him down, shut him in the car, and ran off. The mayor was in the hospital for 10 days after that. This was a problem. Well, the jail in Douglas County, in Omaha, happened to be in the basement. The sheriff and the deputies took the inmates off the roof because the crowd was seeding down below. They finally broke through the doors, went up the metal staircase. When they got to the roof, the panicked inmates shoved the little out of the front and said, take him, take him, black and white alike. They both offered, uh, sacrificed this, this guy. By the time he got to the street, he was basically naked and beaten. The next picture is graphic. Um, soon they hung him, they shot him, they burned his body, and drug it at the end of the rope around the down fence streets. And at the end, they took the ropes and cut them into little pieces and sold them to souvenirs. So, again, we in the Midwest like to think that this sort of racism was a southern problem. Well, Omaha isn't Selma or Birmingham or New Orleans, it's in the West. The next day, as the smoke was still rising, they surveyed the damage in the mayor's office. The ladies of the Red Cross Brigade were made were scandalized to come into our office. I don't know how they felt about poor Will Brown, who was later buried in a pauper's grave. Only a few years ago, some African American activists actually paid to have a stone put on his grave because it was an unmarked grave in the Pompous District of his public cemetery. Across the street was a printing press run by the Fondas, who moved from Grand Island to Omaha. And when the strike broke out, the father turned off the lights, lowered the blinds, sent home the workers, and made his son Henry Fonda, the future actor, who was 14, watch this to the bitter end. And that night, when the road died home, found the cry, and Lady wrote his biography of the saddest things he ever experienced was the horrible injustice that unfolded in the streets in front of his eyes in Omaha that day. Unfortunately, that wasn't an isolated event. Here's a quote from Warren Bee great-grandson of one of Duluth, Minnesota's lynch mob in the 1920s. He what happened in that case? Three circus workers were accused of having molested a Minnesota girl, and they were summarily lynched. Again, like in Omaha Spectacle, um, people photographed smiling as if they were sending these trophies. Um, and again, the men defrocked. And here I'll make a comment. Um, what's interesting, if you study lynching, in almost all cases, black men were depanced, or their pants were on their legs, or they were totally naked. But there's such a pornographic element in this whole phenomenon. Um, there were also white men who've been lynched, a few black women, very few white women. But especially with the black men, there's this strange, sick, pornographic element. And what's interesting is if you study the Holocaust, what was going on in the concentration camps, often what played out between SS officers and camp guards and the Jewish or other inmates, the political inmates or the East European inmates, there's also a certain degree of pornographic things going on. So there's something about people and power and sexuality, it's really interesting that it's so primal. That's where we go to humiliate people and to put them in their place. It's, it's interesting that we should think about as a culture and talk about. We, we struggle with date rapes on campus, we're on campus right now. 
Well, I can identify it from one week because my great grandfather, George Michael Lloyd, for whom I was named, or Michael Lloyd Trans, he was taken by the Klan in the 20s, impressed by Stevenson, the Grand Dragon, or uh, Grand Wizard of Minneapolis. And like hundreds of thousands of Midwesterners joined the Klan in the 20s. Now, we know it was hundreds of thousands. The Klan itself claimed had millions of members. It could have been, but it was hundreds of thousands. If you go to your library and look up the Palimbasas, one of the former Iowa um, historical societies, news magazines, there's a whole issue about the Klan in Iowa. Pictures of thousands of them marching down uh, Locus and Grand Boulevards in um, the morning. Uh, there were Klan events in Marshalltown and in Newton. There was Klan Day at the fair that if you paid your entry, went to the Klan booth and had them stand your ticket, you could get your entry back. Picnics. There was a Klan baseball team in Davenport. In fact, the Davenport had a large Klan. There were Klan bands, <coughs> Klan outings. All right? It was so it was wholesome because they were going to protect decent American values and family and womanhood and all those good things. We also know that they were up to shenanigans in Mason City, for example, the Klan kidnapped a woman who had come in from Colorado to give a speech. She was a socialist. They kidnapped her, a white woman, took her out of the countryside and left her out several miles from town and just positively the road drove away. So she missed her speech. As far as we know, they didn't molest her. They didn't, they didn't regularly kill her. But they kidnapped her since so she could not give her speech in Mason City is scheduled. So the Klan in Mason City, where I grew up, I found this from very early, literally was determining who would have something to say who and I were politically. They would just silence the opposition by kidnapping them and dropping them off the countryside with only a pair of shoes to walk on their car or bike. Again, compared to the first wave of the plan, I think the second wave really did um, an amazing job with their public relations. They hired a firm in Atlanta. Imagine some place job in Atlanta that was to go in Monday through Friday and to come up ways to pull up the plan. Their graphics are quite impressive, especially compared to the amateurish um, cartoons of the first wave. But it all had to do with Rome. There were rumors that the Pope was going to build a palace of gold in Washington. The Pope's going to take over America. Here, this tree must come down. It's the papal tree with serpents, allusion to Ireland, um, monks. All right? Um, then you have this, the men who are refusing to bow to the great image. It's the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic glory, basically, the Pope. All right? And the clan was going to defeat the Pope. Why? Because this great army for truth and mechanism makes Rome tremble. There's the Knights of Columbus tipping off, you know, informing the echelon of Rome. That's the whole idea that American Catholics were actually more loyal to Rome than they were to Washington. And Catholic Americans were principally illoyal. You couldn't depend on them. The first allegiance was not to the US, but to Rome. 100% of Americanism and truth. Those are the banners. What does that mean, 100% of Americanism? I know if you read their materials, the white Anglo Saxons, Catholics and Jews do not apply. Blacks, in any case. So they had a very specific idea who was a real American, who wasn't. Again, if you compare the graphics of the first wave, the 1870s, with their cartoon, St. Patrick's Day in America, 1926. Thousands of planets from chasing out the serpents that St. Patrick didn't get out of Ireland. So it's always a Catholic cross the flag of the Bible. Um, I guess Protestantism is true Americanism. And sheet music. Those of you who the first program earlier today about I think German Stereo World War I saw sheet music in the First World War also informed people how to behave. Well, here's sheet music again. We are all loyal clansmen. And then, of course, you have the marches. There were two in Washington. There's the Capitol at the end of the front line um, in 25 and 26. The biggest one had 40,000 people. They put on these marches. They were impressive. They had their goods raised, for example. They showed their great stand by. They said, yes, we're doing this. This is us. We're here. But the reality was, of course, something different. But it looked good. So I'm going to go too deeply. So what was it that was so impressive about these marches? Um, can you imagine if you have 40,000 people marching? The logistics, 40,000 uniforms, 
of anything. Boy Scouts, the, the clergy, anything, but 40,000 uniforms is a mountain of uniforms. And then to train people in a short fashion, like maybe overnight, after they've all gathered the day before, um, how to form formation, how to march in unison, it's not that easy. We could barely get our 4-H club to do that in the 60s, and that was 20 boys. Um, so this is really quite impressive, and they knew that it would be. That's why they did this. So the clan went to town, so to speak, to show that they had arrived, and that they were a force to reckon with in America. Film from the event. Notice they're marching clad in cross formation and they're per marching perfectly. How does how? I didn't say twine. I mean, this is an amazing spectacle. It's obnoxious, it's disgusting, but it's amazing. It reminds me of the Hitler uh, appearances in Nuremberg 10 years later, the Nazi party rallies in Nuremberg. Also, to impress people, this is great propaganda. You get pictures of this out in the public, people are impressed. It's, it's impressive. Mm -hmm. Endless marches for hours. <coughs> Flag, of course, throughout, but very common. Using these motifs that we all know and have feelings about. The rank and file, pure flags. And the women's, the ladies' auxiliary. Patriotic motifs and sands, that's a woman in the sun drag, um, banners, cross. And so you remember chapter numbers. So plan words. What about the lonely clansmen out in the hinterland trying to advance clan ideals? Here's a picture of the first parade in Northern States of Klan's Clan, first daylight parade in the USA, Milo, Maine, uh, the 3rd of September, 1923. Indeed, you could cross all of America, everywhere, and find messages of the Klan. Here's again the ladies' auxiliary with the patriotic motifs, like the drummer, Mason City, Iowa, where I'm from, comparing the parade with a really quaint float at a warm schoolhouse. What could be more archetypal of rural America than a warm schoolhouse except for the county church? Clan uniforms. And we know that my great grandfather was on his march. The 18 members of the clan carried a coffin down Federal Avenue to the cemetery and held a clan burial. Do you know what the year of that was? I don't know, 2024. I can look it up in the early 20s. So who were these people? It's one thing to sit in 2018 in Ella, Iowa, in a college um, lecture hall and think about all this in the abstract. What about the concrete? So if you look at my great grandpa, for example, my appearance is safe. He looks like a normal Iowa farmer. There's this wedding picture to my great grandmother, Maria, the wedding invitation. He came from a large family, a loving family. They lived oddly enough, oddly very old on average. They lived to be, I would say, seven years old. I don't know in the genes. I hope I inherited some of that. <clears throat> they were close-knit. There's his brother, Henry, who we know is gay. There's the patriarch, my great-great-grandfather, who was a fiddler. Now, what's interesting is what were the motives of the Lyrics in rural Belmont, Iowa, about Iowa, to be part of this clan? Well, there might be a clue here, perhaps. 
already as a boy, my great grandfather and his brother Henry were recruited to be in the family band. Later, their father Lewis had his own band. And in fact, in summer evenings, the Belmont would stand um, at the corner of Main and Elm and Saturday, the townspeople would come and watch and probably they applaud. <coughs> but great grandpa had his farm near the Dell, a little prairie town up the road from Belmont. Typical could be any generic prairie town with the grain silos and the <coughs> train station. But the farm was just on the road from Nigger Bridge. Where does that name come from? Well, there's an article that's posted in the world from 1987. Um, federal officials have counted. There are dozens of place names in America. Dead Nigger Slough, Nigger Creek, and I hope we had Nigger Bridge. Why? Because there was a black couple in Missouri that, for their wedding present, had been given the freedom from their own in the 1950s. They moved, went north, it was the frontier days, they ended up in northern Iowa, and they tried to farm just down the road from the Lewis at this bridge. Eventually, the husband died. The, the widow eventually drifted off with some of the children, but the name stayed. <coughs> what we do know is that he was a fiddler. He was a competitor to my great-grandfather, the fitting gates. Now, I want to um, back up a few frames, at least in our minds, if not really on the screen. When I talk about the rabbit anti-Catholicism, there were almost no black people in Iowa in that period. In rural Midwest, there were almost no black people. I was trouble before I met a black person growing up in the 60s and 70s in Northern Iowa. So what was going on with this anti-Catholic stuff? During World War I, headhunters went to Brooklyn and brought Italian workers to Des Moines. They went to Scranton, Harrisburg, and brought um, Slovaks and Croatians to Omaha, Council Bluffs. They brought Irish from Boston. They brought African Americans from the Delta states to replace the labor that was lost while, quote, our boys, so my great grandfather's brother who pen was served in France, while they were gone fighting, they had to have labor replacement. And all those girls taking off their corsets and cutting their hair short and throwing their bonnets away couldn't shore up the labor shortage, so they imported labor. Poles. When, quote, our boys, the Protestant right Anglo Saxon returned, they said, oh, you're in my job. Well, all the people that were pointing at, you're in my job, they happen to be Catholic. The Irish, the Italians, the Poles, the Slovenians. So it's very convenient. I'm not a Marxist, but Karl Marx says that the germ of every political struggle has an economic spark. Well, I wonder if that plays out on the micro level. So down the road from Lewis, where there's a fiddler and making this money to supplement the family's income, there's an African American also fiddling. I wonder. Because that's the only contact they would have with African Americans that met by the world and they that. At any rate, back to the biographical sketch, because we're doing investigative reporting here. Grandpa and his father moved to Hampton for a year because his father got a job in one of the first auto mechanic shops in Northern Iowa in Hampton. Um, but he only stayed there for a year, and then great grandpa took the family back to the farm. Okay. Because of this, World War I was coming. And by being a farmer, great grandpa was in a more essential industry. Plus, he had another child, his first daughter arrived, so he couldn't be drafted. Clever, huh? And he signed up anyway, you had to, you had to register for the draft. He put farming as his occupation in big letters. Here it says if a person is of African descent, cut off his former. So, literally, the draft cards and the registration for serving in the army in World War I, the US government kind of was fishing out African Americans because they wouldn't ever serve the white soldiers. They literally called them out, okay? Right away by clicking the card. And so in your file box, you find all the African Americans easily by flipping the corners. Now, look my grandfather. You can see that my grandfather was the apple of their eye. Daughters came, and she three. And then his kids should have had a lovely childhood. It was the 20s. Um, the rural sector wasn't doing well, but America was booming as such. Consumer, flood consumer items without end. But there was always a specter. We know that great grandpa was in the clan because Aunt Thelma confided to her children, my dad's cousins, that one day she was out playing the barn, and up in the rafters, as white robe and a pointed hood. 
And she also told that her mother, or children's mother, was furious that my great-grandfather went on this march down Fellow Avenue to the fairgrounds and met Hoffman. No one else ever mentioned it in the family, ever. Okay? We know that across Iowa, there were planned rallies, events, meetings. You know, Cheaton, Iowa's highest geographical point in northwest Iowa, the corner, there were big cross burnings to say, we're claiming Iowa for the pink and cake cause. And for several years, there was normal occurrence to see hooded clansmen driving around Iowa in daylight, going about their business. Um, we had our bus tour in southern Iowa, in Knoxville, in Cheriton, home of Heidi, <coughs> in Fairfield. Everywhere we went, someone eventually came up and said, I actually used to burn crosses down the cow pasture. So everyone knows this in a certain generation, they've already talked about it. But when we were doing our exhibits, <coughs> they'd come and say, do you know? They'd come with old photographs and give them to us and say, don't tell me that I gave it to you. But because my, my uncle was at this. What did we learn growing up in Iowa in the 60s and 70s about the Klan in Iowa? Nothing. We learned nothing about it. I come from a schizophrenic background. My mother's people actually had a uh, grandma's foot doctor, was an African American, was a city. My mother hung out with his children, went to residence camp, and shared a, shared a bunk room with Cynthia. Um, and I read had Mexican American friends. But not my dad's people. That's us with great grandpa, okay? Well, I knew him up, all right? Again, we're looking at just one example who joined the plan. Now, people are complex. I'm complex, I assume you're complex. Notice that in this photo of Threshing, he's behind the machinery. Why did he join the plan? He probably thought he can protect his family, he can benefit his family, there might be professional connections. Here he is, though, on the edge of society, because the Klan is not your mainstream way to affect the world. It's not being a Democrat, Republican, or being an elected official. It's going behind the scenes at night, down country lanes, and if need be to terrorize over Catholics or African Americans. Grandfather, of course, is there. So we're looking for clues, like detectives, trying to ferret out from the photos what's going on. Again, my dad, my grandfather, the tractor, my great grandparents in the background. This is about 1940 or so, probably World War I, we joined World War I. By the end of the war, it looks like a normal married Midwest guy. The photos with children go by the other, but we know that soon after the war, he ran away from his wife, and 20 years later visited his now adult children and grandchildren. Um, he was complex. When my mom met my dad in the 50s, they went to Missouri to visit great grandpa with his second wife. Among whom he ran away in the night, Olga, and his wife. He was a loving great grandfather. We loved him, we all did. My sister, my brother, but, and, and he was the, still the patriarch of our family, my brother, my father, grandfather, and he. But we never imagined that he'd been a part of this. This is the clan of Sheridan, Iowa. Again, like my great grandfather, they used to take the deceased um, fellows at our processions. There's a hearse on the left. You know, so what's going on? This contrast between the loving great-grandfather, the family member, and this, this being part of a terror organization. All I can do is I try to find some empathy for him, the man that I experienced as a boy with the man that was a Ku Klux Klan member. And I know that he never had much money. But like my mother's people, there were tenant farmers that moved almost every year. After they left Missouri, all of them went back to her native Nebraska. And they were dirt farmers, okay? They died with just enough money to get, get by, but not much left. This is a, a scene of the clan in Colorado in the 20s. And you notice the banality of it all? Well, they're just a bunch of guys in white coats having a good time. Well, the banality of one's family can say a lot. If you take apart my great-grandfather's blood in 1947, my Aunt Elaine, who was then still a girl, Here's the transcribed of all mistakes. He was almost illiterate. The way he spells daughter, um, busy in the field, I suppose. Okay. So he was a man, poorly educated, only went to eighth grade high grade in school. Not much money. And always wanting who will threaten our income. 
taking home with being Catholics, take our jobs, go our brothers off, find work, take them home in. So we need to dissect these people and wonder what made them tick. Was it natural to join the clan? There were reasons, meaning we wouldn't agree with them, understand them, but they had the reasons. The ones that I find, I, I don't like. At any rate, the clan did flourish with all this pageantry, its sections down the main streets with deadly results. And it went on to find enough people said, stop, it's enough. The second wave of the clan then subsided, and unfortunately, after World War II, a third wave arose. Um, it doesn't have a snazzy name of the second wave. Um, it tends to be resurgent every few years, but only a couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, I think like the 1920s with the mass marches and the impressive membership. However, what's interesting is where organized racism arises when you suspect it, like in Boston in the 70s and 80s with forced busing. Okay, the Klan had some followers there during that period, and I love this photo, the wounded transfer from the demo is being saved by all African American medical team. That's justice. Um, modern clan has its own symbols. If you can't feed them, don't weed them. An African youth with nappy hair and chicken drumstick and watermelon. Other disgusting symbols like from the Nazis. Very clearly Nazi influence. The clan indoctrinates its children very young. Membership is important. These children are still clan values. I bring a cross. I get the boy having the cross. Right? You get the metaphors. Um, they have the rituals at night. They have the quasi religious ceremonies. Again, the Confederate flag and sword. They have their own culinary culture. Support your race, feed your face. KKK kitchen. Okay, all persons go to IKA. We can retreats down lonely country roads in the woods. They have their picnics. You can have a planned wedding, quite lovely, you know, lovely, quite and quite. And the plan today seems to attract a certain class of people. They tend to be quite educated and grown. Well, it's interesting, like with many of these nameless groups or hate groups, they have a lost cause. It's always had to be a lost cause. The Nazis had their lost cause. Um, the not the German humiliation of World War I, the plan. Having lost the South, I mean, the Confederacy is gone, folks. It's probably not coming back, hopefully not. But to keep pushing it, that Dixie might rise again. You know, march around at night and sing praises unto laws, white supremacy, is really ridiculous and not really productive. It's really scary and sad. Any questions, comments about this story? Yeah. I had a question about like the first march you talked about because we said quite a lot of people like like watching it, actually like taking part in it, but like watching it. And so I had like generally like, two questions. First, do you know how many people actually like watched it? Were like in the streets to watch it? And second, like, do you know if they were actually like allies of the plan or just like curious about what was going on? Well, we know that there were, by New York Times um, estimates, of 40,000 people in the march. I don't know how many were watching. The sidewalk seemed to be fairly full, you know, six or eight people deep. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of spectators of what we can see. But the spectators, like in Mason City, the article said, people were curious. They wanted to see if they recognized someone. They're watching the march. The people were unveiled. You could see their faces. In Mason City, they were veiled. I mean, it's, it's an eerie spectacle. I mean, people are curious. This is bizarre curiosity about these folks willing to, to do this, played around in white sheets. And so I imagine they weren't all supporters. I've gone in Dresden to uh, Pegida demonstrations to see what's going on. And I'm only an anti Pegida, the uh, anti foreign movement in East Germany. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone here is from Sheraton. Anybody here from Sheraton? <laughs> okay, I was I was at their museum last spring, and so I just think about history and memory and how we remember our local history and things like that. And in their um, museum, which is actually I think a pretty nice local history museum, there's nothing about their clan presence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, so I don't really have a question, I guess, but just sort of saying 
you know, I mean, um, I guess I would I would understand why that wouldn't be there, but but it makes me wonder, you know, then how. But there's a lot of places, a lot of towns that have clan presence that you know, maybe don't want to remember. Greenfield, Iowa, um, was a clan, a clan stronghold in the, in the 20s. When I had the bus there, they would show me chairs in the community center. It was built by the clan. It said donated by the local clan and the bottom of the chairs. Uh, it was a big deal in Greenfield, Iowa. I'm trying to get to one photo in particular um, of Sheridan, Iowa. Right. So, I saw you. Yeah. Um, if I get there, it should be right about. That, uh, that yeah. Ferris wheel photo, that, is, that kind of crap's in there. Yeah, it's, it's too <laughs> much. On the um, see this photo? <clears throat> the public library in Sheridan, Iowa, is behind this church. The church is still there, but it's no longer has its tower and the St. Louis windows have been knocked out. I think it might be an apartment house. At the end of the same block on this corner, there's a mechanic shop. We were showing our Brasinum, our mobile bus exhibit, and we had a breakdown. The door wasn't working. And the library said, well, when you're done, go around the block. Dimensionally opposite the library, library is a mechanic who fix your door. So as soon as we got done, we went literally around two sides of the block. And while the man is fixing our bus door, he says, oh, you're in Sheridan, sure, showing out history, are you? Yes. You know what plan was here? I said, really? Yeah, just a minute. And this guy with this long beard and greasy rag and torn pocket he went in, opened a flying cabinet drawer. I was with him, so was our other bus driver, a Jew, and brought me from St. Paul. He pulls out this drawer and opens up a folder and picks up this photo of the clan marching past his shop. So I mean he knew about it. He had a couple photos. This is one of two that we got from them. Mm. But, you know, your parents and grandparents have probably not told you everything they know. Mm. They know things they're not telling you. Either they've forgotten or they don't want to tell you. But those histories are there. I can tell you, everyone we went to Iowa. Wellsburg, Iowa, just heavily German American. The woman, were the nice farm woman who stayed the night uh, in their place, she said, yep. In the 20s down the road around the corner, they were going in the cow pasture on the creek going across. Everyone we went, people said, yeah, the clan, this and that. And in Sun Island, we were in Knoxville, we were in um, Fairfield. They said that almost all the Protestant pastors in the town were in the clan. Hmm. So Knoxville is not too far from here. Yeah. It's not even 20 miles. I don't know about Ella and the clan, but Marshalltown and Newton were in the clan. Mm -hmm. 